So what I'd like to do is uh, first to ask you why you came to this session, what your experiences have been with slowing down learning, whether it's simply reading, whether it's study time for students, whether it's with technology or without technology, what your concerns are, what your experiences have been with students' time management, with your own time management, and any conclusions that you have drawn from your teaching experience regarding this, even if it's just a wish list, I wish such and such about this mode of learning, which has to do with taking more time, longer time, longer blocks of uninterrupted time, in which people are able to concentrate on whatever format they need to concentrate on, whether it's reading, whether it's analyzing spreadsheets, whether it is looking at a work of art, whether it is uh, analyzing data. I'm just interested in why people are here and what, what your hopes or reactions are, uh, just before you even look at any of this material. So, um, so in some ways, what what drew me here is that I feel like I spend part of my time in my teaching thinking about what things might I make more efficient or accelerate in terms of tool sets, you know, vocabulary, skills, etc. And then what are those things that I think are most amenable to a deeper, slower, more engaged, more self-driven kind of process, and how those two things complement each other. Ultimately, so what should be slow and really benefits from that, and what really could be fast, so frankly we can get to the slow. Yeah. Now let me just interrupt there. Because in your reading, you will find no reason to turn to it now, but you'll find a summary of what some psychologists call process one learning and process two learning. And process one is a kind of quicker, semi-automatic getting things fast, sort of assimilating information, and process two is quite different, and they apparently relate to different neurosystems mm -hmm. and how one, so so thinking, so that's one, one way to focus on yeah. Yes, I'm a librarian, and um, I miss Sue Gilbray. I work in the Lock Library, and I work a lot, as do my co colleagues here with undergraduates, and we're always, I like to talk to me sometimes about the pleasure of going slow when you're doing research because, you know, we live in a world that's so accelerated, as you were saying, um, and they kind of have this grab-and-go, get-it-done mentality, but there is something really wonderful when you can get them to think about why they need to stop and pay attention and what they learn by even sort of watching themselves go a little more slowly in a process like research um, or adapting even their habits to the outside world, which may not, you know, have the same hours that they do um, or, you know, may not be as lenient in some ways with the things that, you know, they expect that they can do in a space. Um, and so, yeah, that's why I'm here. What would, you, what would you say are some of the identifiable benefits or a benefit that students have said to you they have discovered when they have slowed down? I think they've discovered how much fun research can be and how much they can feel like they actually begin to kind of own their learning. Um, and, you know, for me sometimes, I, mean, I know some research projects, for example, are things that they're just going to get through. Um, not everything is going to speak to them the same way, but I always encourage them to sort of like have at least one experience, a semester or a year, um, you know, if that's possible, semester would be my like great goal, in which they really are so interested in a topic, they kind of like begin to fall into it and just really take their time to just see it in a whole new way as more than just an assignment, but um, as something in which they're really proud of, of being able to talk about it, um, to understand it in a deep way. Um, and that they remember the experience of learning, not just the, the product itself. So. Um, so I'm Mary Lewis from the History Department. Um, so I had a couple little quick anecdotes about maybe why I'm here. I had at one time assigned a film that the students were supposed to watch on their own because I found it very unsuccessful to try and get them to come together, unfortunately to slow down and watch something for two hours. And this student said, came the next day to class, and he said, oh my god, Professor Lewis, I got to Lamont. And then somebody had, it was VHS, and somebody had not rewound the tape. And I sat there, and I waited, and I waited. 
And finally, I just gave up and went home and got it on Netflix. And I thought, the time it took you to go back to your house, find out if Netflix had this first. You know, and this was a great student, a great student. But he just couldn't sit and wait for a VHS to rewind. So it tells you something about 21st century, I think. Um, other anecdote, I took my students to Houghton. We had two days slotted out of class for looking at some documents that I pre-selected because I thought it would be too overwhelming for them and for me, for that matter. I mean, there are hundreds, you know, tens of thousands of documents pertaining to this particular thing that we were looking at. So postcards, broadsides, all kinds of things relating to the Dreyfus affair in late 19th century France, which Houghton has a lot of. And, you know, they had to pick one and curate, you know, right later curate it, like as if we were going to have a, an exposition of the documents they chose. And in the queues, the students said two days was too many at home. Some of them said this. Others of them really liked it. So I thought, I'm damned no matter what I do, you know. I just can't get them to appreciate that slowing down the way I want them to. I can't get 20 kids to watch a film at the same time. I can't get the ones that are watching it on their own to sit there to watch it. And so what do you do, ma'am? I don't know. That's why I'm here, Jim. <laughs> I've had, the same, I've had the same trouble, by the way, especially with films that I've asked students to look at. Yeah. Other, other comments? Yes. Um, I'm Jennifer Roberts. I'm in History of Art and Architecture. And I gave a talk at this conference three or four years ago about making my students look at a painting for three hours before um, writing or actually doing any research about it. So it's something that I've been thinking a lot about. Um, and while I continue to I continue to assign this assignment, and I think it's very successful. It's still just one assignment in a whole semester, mm -hmm. and I'm struggling with how to make the idea of deep attention something that's more that, that pervades the entire learning experience over the semester, and isn't just this sort of special slow day that we have right. uh, in front of a work of art. And, um, and I'm always struggling with the kind of trade-offs that have to happen when you want to give students a, a deeper and more intensive experience with an object or a text, um, it almost always involves a very difficult set of decisions about your pedagogical priorities, about what is the one lesson that you want to distill out of a, out of a class session because it always involves cutting out content, cutting out the quantity of content in order to in include the quality of learning. Um, and that's just something I'm, I'm constantly working through. Um, I'm interested now in thinking about, one of, the, one of the things I've been thinking a lot about is how to integrate making activities into the curriculum. And I'm interested in thinking about how making can be another experience of um, working through resistances and producing an object as something that necessarily will force students to slow down and face uh, temporalities of you know, stone or wood or what have you uh, that's different from the temporalities in which they normally live. I mean, you can't, you can't rush producing an object that you'll be immediately confronted with failures that you may not be otherwise. So it's a, just a different way of working and thinking that I'm interested in exploring along these lines. And then finally, I, I think none of these discussions can happen and be effective unless we address the sort of larger culture of rush and busyness that we all live every day and continue to subscribe to. And we, like it or not, we live in a culture where... Um, racing around and being busy and working 75 hours a week is seen as um, virtuous. Mm -hmm. Why don't, why aren't these other behaviors seen as virtuous? And um, just, right. Uh, and, and the culture at Harvard of being a faculty member, while I love Harvard, <laughs> and it's, it's similar everywhere else, I'm sure, is, is such that there is no, there are no checks on our um, mm. time. No one is making sure that we're not 
oversubscribing ourselves. We're responsible for setting limits on our time, and yet um, all of the pressures are for us to continually oversubscribe and overcommit ourselves. So I think it's also connected to the, the examples that we set for our students in the way we the way we're constantly rushing and they see us and they yeah. they see us frazzled can every day. <laughs> can I ask you about that when you ask them to make something and you, you are right, if they rush that they can often experience failures. How do you time that so that there's a due date that actually is reasonable for them? Because mm -hmm. I remember when I was in art school many years ago now, um, I was working on a woodcut, and there was a deadline on it that meant that I was furiously like digging into this wood, <laughs> and it was very difficult not to nick the important parts I was trying to preserve because I was just so rushed, and the professor was putting a lot of time mm -hmm. pressure on me. So how do you handle that, even with making something? Right. It's due, right, at some point. Well, nor I mean, I, I I'm just beginning to try to integrate that into my teaching, and I'm not an art studio teacher, and that's one of the issues here, but um, what the way I tend to integrate that into my teaching is how to be a class time activity, so it's not homework making, but if there's a two-hour class or a four-hour studio, then um, the students are just expected to work on the project during that period, and they don't it's the idea is not to have them finish it necessarily, but, but to be kind of forced to slow down and actually work through the problems physically in front of them. Um, but it is an issue um, that has come up many times is that the sort of time, the way time is organized, at least in FAS and the humanities and um, social sciences, that you have these at most two hour course periods. But um, studio students, for example, have six hour studios and labs and the sciences, I assume, are substantially longer, so it's the question, too, of the, the temporal frame around the courses and the mm. curriculum. Mm -hmm. uh, yes? Um, so I TF for two classes, so there's a practicum course, which is kind of new at the ed school, where um, students work with, uh, so I'm part of the teaching and learning lab, and so students work with each of us on sort of independent capstone projects, um, and so I came to this because I saw the benefits of frustration and because a lot of their projects are kind of open-ended, but they're kind of tied to higher stakes than just a grade because a lot of times what, what they'll be producing is something we may use, something that may launch, something that's going to go out into the world. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot more pressure sort of externally imposed on them. And so they feel... Uh, they naturally feel very frustrated um, and they feel very stressed out about it. And, and I want to be able to balance that that sense of frustration and ambiguity um, because I think that's kind of necessary for the kind of work they'll be going into, but also like how do I scaffold it so they don't feel completely overwhelmed? So that's one, one reason I came. Um, and a couple of things that I've tried um, is to really kind of maximize the community. So uh, they're part of a strand. Um, so we kind of have like group meetings or community meetings where they can kind of talk about where they're uh, feeling frustrated or where they need help and then we can kind of pull resources. And then another thing I've had them do is part of the jobs they'll be going into require project management. And so uh, working with them to think about their projects from that point of view and how do they scaffold their, I mean, how do they break down their time? How do they organize it from a, a particular framework, um, which I've found to be helpful, but it's also another skill that they have to learn on top of whatever it is they're doing. Um, and so, yeah, that's that's kind of something that I'm really interested in doing is is like, yeah, how do you take that? How do you combine it with all of the other things that they're doing, and then provide the necessary supports and stuff that they need while still sort of making them a little bit like frustrated and like struggle. Um, so yeah, so that, that's my very curious. Do you then, talk with students individually about this uh, in? conference or conversation? Yeah, so are my individual students, I, I meet with them once a week, um, and then we also have larger group meetings where they're all part of the same, what we call strand. Um, so it's an area within our team that focuses on the same types of things, and then we all meet uh, once a week to discuss as a team, um, you know, where they're struggling and what they're doing and, and that kind of thing. Um, yeah. um, well, I just was struck by your discussion about um, art and um, 
learning, studying a painting. So I'm just taking it from my own experience. I've taken two art classes. Um, one of them was a drawing class when I was in college, and another one was an animation college. And in both, both the classes, we were required to draw 100 of the same object, 100 boxes or 100 apples, and it was in two days. And it was, I felt it was so boring, but by the end of it, I understood what was being taught, and all of a sudden I had muscle memory, and I just had, there was all sorts of um, understandings that I felt like I learned so much more quickly than I would have if I had had like an assignment in the class that was much less focused, you know, just be able to see that box, be able to see that apple. And I took an animation class and it was the same thing, 30, 30 evil characters, 30 heroes, take those <laughs> characters and, and out of all of that, find the one that is the one that you want to present to class. And there's some, and again, I started, uh, I don't know how to draw, I don't know how to do anything, and then by the end of it, I found a style. And I feel like there's something very helpful in that process of seeing what you're capable of and what the thought process is, which is very helpful. And you go through the frustration, but you arrive at a really empowering point. Mm -hmm. So the iterative quality mm -hmm. of it is important. Too. Yeah, definitely. The time to practice something over and over. It's one of the reasons why I often ask students to rewrite their papers, because I think that unless they find out what their best work is, they won't strive to achieve it. And their best work is usually not what they first turn in, in a paper. I know they can do better, and they actually know they can do better too, but they are so used to turning in things and getting a pretty good grade, and then just moving on to the next assignment. And if someone actually tells them, um, here are a few ways you can make it better, and then they find more, then they've actually, in a sense, with some help, coached themselves back up to a higher level. So I actually assign fewer, technically fewer pages of writing, but in the end, it's double the number on the syllabus because they're mm -hmm. rewriting. Now, that's just one example from writing, but I could, mm -hmm. your example in the visual arts was very similar. I've thought about this in terms of reading as well. I taught a seminar on critical theory last semester, dense, difficult texts. Um, and they require a careful and close attention, um, which I think students, including students in the humanities, may not be um, practiced uh, at giving those texts. Um, so we talked about reading as process as well, first draft readings. Um, that might be a, an initial scan of the reading to see what's the shape of this argument. Um, and then a second reading that might be what, what's the texture in and substance of that argument, and then maybe even a third reading. Now, we talked about this. Whether my students practice it, I'm, I'm, I'm less sure of, um, but trying to also introduce them to this notion of, of reading as process that might itself have drafts or iterations. I tell students when they revise papers, don't try to revise everything all at once. Look at structure in one revision, look at word choice in another revision, because when you try to do it all at once, it's psychologically overwhelming for many people. It is for me. I sit down and say, well, I'm going to rewrite this whole paper from beginning to end in every way. It's, it's very hard to do that. Are there other thoughts? Yes. Um, I had the opportunity this summer to teach in Harvard School's new non-credit pre-college program. Mm -hmm. I was teaching um, introductory computer science, which is almost fundamentally a making type of discipline. Um, so students experience a lot of that frustration. They have to take the necessary time. But it was very freeing to be in an, a non-credit um, environment because I didn't have to force them on particular deadlines. Um, so I could let each student spend the time that they needed on a particular piece of their learning. And it was, uh, it, it was much better experience that way, I think, for the students than um, having to push them on to the next subject or having to make them, having them make themselves stay up all night finishing their homework. So um, that, that was a new experience. Uh, for me that I felt really helped with the slowing down. Uh, although honestly, why I came to this is that I was looking through the gen ed uh, course listings and I read the description and the Q evaluations from your rhetoric course and I've never seen anything like what, how students felt about that course on something that was such an important element of uh, undergraduate learning, how to write and 
who is really what they said, that nothing has made my writing more better more than this class. So I came here pretty much to experience your teaching. <laughs> Slow down. Well, you have a piece of writing you'd like to show. Uh, well, I mean, one of the things I did in that class was try to get students to internalize uh, criticism so that they became their own toughest editor, so that they set a standard internally. And as soon as students did that, the improvement was almost automatic. But it's, it's that bit of a leap where they're no longer doing it for the professor. They're no longer asking, what does my professor want? What am I expected to turn in? But they're actually looking at their work as an object that is somewhat detached for them, from themselves that they are trying to perfect. And one, one of the things is that always realizing that the audience is not me. A lot of those students have gone on to be speech writers. They've gone on to be speechwriters, I'm glad to say, for both political parties, too. And, but it's an internalization that occurred, and just trying to let them know that they can do that, and that everyone's going to do it in a slightly different way. I mean, that's, that, that was part of the reward of teaching that course, but I didn't, I didn't know that at, at first. I didn't have them do all the rewriting the first time I taught the course. Yeah, Ron. Um, so, so one thing I'm wondering about is, um, and, it, and it really triggers off of what you just said, um, something I find myself saying to student advisees all the time when they ask me, so Professor Lou, how do I figure out you know, what I should be doing? And one answer I give sometimes, actually often, is find that thing that allows you to live outside of time, where you're engaged with it, and you don't see the clock, you don't feel the hours at all. And to me, that's often tied up with exactly what you said, an internalization of agency, where you really, it's, you're doing this because you want to do it. And so sometimes I think that slowness is also very much linked with, frankly, being outside of time, where you, you own it, you own what's happening so much that you spend the hours and you don't feel. Someone, someone isn't making you do that. So, you know, which leads to, leads to my other thing about this issue of slow. Is it so much slow? Or is it sort of a question of being outside of someone else's time frame? But is it also a question almost of density? So in other words, you can spend a lot of time that's super packed. There's so much work that you need to spend 12 hours straight on a problem set. That's long, but it's not slow. Mm -hmm. So I'm wondering, is slow also something where it's open enough that you have those spaces to own it, think about it, really reflect on it? How do you find that balance where you're not making them spend six hours because you have given them so much to do that they can only do it in six hours? Here it comes back to the wood cut experience where perhaps you didn't have enough time. So you could, you, there was no space in that. Yes, I would you. have gotten into the flow easily without that time pressure on me because mm -hmm. I would have enjoyed it so much. Yeah, so I'm really interested in this density agency. Some of the research that's mentioned briefly in this packet says that the amount of time that students spend on things is only loosely correlated to their achievement. And, and, you know, that's counterintuitive in some kind of way, but research in sports confirms this, that there are people who practice a sport for endless hours and they don't really improve very much in the sport. I know. <laughs> but it's the kind of focused practice you do. You focus on improving something, you concentrate on something, and then there's that density. And while you're doing it, in a way, it slows things down, but it doesn't necessarily have to be a huge, long period of time. Right? Mm -hmm. But this, this whole notion of it's not an assignment, it's like you've assigned it to yourself. It's like you've become obsessed with it in a good kind of way. It seems to me to be a, 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 
uh, something that is only rarely achieved often. Um, yeah, Jennifer. I was just, I wanted to follow up on your comments, which were largely about terminology. And I think that one of the thing, one of the challenges that I often face with students is simply convincing them that there's value in this other approach. And I wonder, I've often wondered whether slow is actually a, a counterproductive term for